Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 2.15 afternoon press conference for the City of Grand Forks. Uh, and uh, we have uh, quite a lineup today, so we'll get started right away. Uh, Mayor Brown. Thank you, John. So welcome to the Grand Forks Virtual News Conference, Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Today, our panelists include Senator Kramer and Congressman Armstrong. And for the question and answer portion, we'll have Todd Thielen, City Administrator, and Deborah Swanson, Director of Public Health. So we are grateful to be joined by two members of our federal congressional delegation this afternoon with Senator Kramer and Congressman Armstrong as panelists. Senator Armstrong and Congressman Armstrong, as, we, as well as Senator Hoven, have been strong advocates for the state of North Dakota and the Grand Forks community through the support of the Grand Forks Air Force Base, airport funding, CARES Act funding, and their advocacy for our energy and agriculture industries. And we thank them for their partnership and support. Consumer confidence is the key to a GS Smart restart, and we know the residents of Grand Forks want to support local businesses. Last night, we briefed the City Council on our framework for a short and long-term economic recovery strategies. I'll be working with council members and community leaders on actions moving forward on our GS Smart restart. At the federal level, the CARES Act funding has served as a lifeline for businesses in key industries, especially for our North Dakota businesses with the Paytech Protection Program SBA loans, and expanded unemployment insurance. In fact, North Dakota and Grand Forks businesses have been the leaders with the utilization of the Paycheck Protection Program due to the close relationships of our local banks across the state that they have with the Bank of North Dakota. In addition, there have been direct support of the GFK Airport with nearly $19 million. This is incredibly important and appreciated. And in just direct supplies and personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers, the federal impact has been huge. We know there'll also be direct reimbursements for COVID related activity coming from the federal government through the appropriation of $1.25 billion to the state of North Dakota, of which some will trickle down to the city of Grand Forks. Finally, we continue to express support for COVID assistance to recover revenue lost in areas like sales tax revenue for states and cities. In fact, just last week, Senator Kramer sponsored a bill that would provide that relief. Taking an all government approach is so important and leaders of the local and state and federal level model the good partnerships necessary for effective response. And with that, we'll send it over to Senator Kramer for an update. Welcome, Senator. Excuse me, Senator, we need to unmute your mic, sir. How's that? Sorry, sorry about that. That's, that was that's my just fault. fine. That's just no problem. Um, but thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, good to see you, Kelly, and, and folks. Um, it's kind of a kind of a big day around here. You know, it, it seems like when you come to this place and there's not a lot going on, and you, you, know, you confirm some judges, which is not unimportant, um, but you sort of feel like you ought to get something else done. And today was a good day because today was the day that um, President Trump and Secretary Purdue announced the details of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, egg, uh, egg uh, support program, direct payment program for our farmers and ranchers. And we knew that it was in the works. We knew that it would be coming soon, um, but the details came out today and it's, it amounts uh, to $16 billion uh, in direct payments to farmers and, and then another 3 billion in food aid. Uh, obviously farmers raise food to, to feed people and uh, Ivanka Trump has, as you know, but put together a pretty good program to take advantage of some of our extra commodities, get them into food banks, get them to hungry people. And so it's a $19 billion program, but uh, there were some, there were some pretty nice little nuggets, frankly, um, for North Dakota and, and, uh, and other states like us, but particularly up on the Northern tier, for example, um, corn was included in the program, as you might've recalled uh, in earlier MFP programs, corn, got in there but it wasn't a it wasn't a real uh, robust support shall we say and, and uh, this time uh, corn corn is on the list of, of uh, premium primary crops that are covered uh, but another important one particularly probably to folks in the, the northern regions and uh, and that is of course canola canola had been previously left out of some of the MFP programs it is included in this one so we're really grateful to the secretary for that um, another one this is more of a western North Dakota thing but We've been advocating for uh, our sheep ranchers. You know, it's a funny thing about the, the livestock industry. Kelly knows this better than anybody because he he's, lives around cowboys all the time. They don't ask for a lot. In fact, sometimes, sometimes when you ask them what they'd like, they just say, leave us alone. 
Um, but that's not the case in this uh, during this difficult time. As you know, our hog producers, our, our um, obviously our cattlemen, our cowboys, and and our sheep ranchers all have been hit really hard by not just a, a low price cycle, but a you know a recent low price um, you know drop out of just right out, out of the bottom. And um, and so they're they're in need of help, and there's some help on the way. In fact, livestock was a, a big focus of this particular program. Here's the, the most important information, though, you guys, and that is that for the farmers and ranchers, producers, um, you know, bankers, people that are that are watching or listening to this, um, if, if you are have an interest in the program, uh, it opens up May 26th. So next week, it opens up for application at your county FSA office. Get over there and you get at the front of the line. So, the, Mary, you mentioned that the uh, PPP that North Dakota really, really hit the ball out of the park with the Paycheck Protection Program. And uh, while there are a few that probably fell through the cracks, all in all, North Dakota did finish in, as the state that per capita that um, took care of our took care of our workers the best with the PPP program. And that's really more a tribute to our bankers and our credit unions, um, even, our, even our FSA. Um, they, they were well prepared. We got them, uh, information early in the process. Uh, talked to the small businesses and their clients early in the process. So they were off and running as soon as it opened up. And so uh, I would just say, get to your FSA office, get ready. May 26th, uh, the applications opened up. The president said today uh, at the White House, and I just finished, I just came back from having lunch with him and uh, he joined our, our Senate lunch today. And he said uh, seven days, he wants the money in the farmers or ranchers hands uh, seven days after, after uh, the application. So, um, you know, I, I know you've been waiting for it. Um, yesterday would have been better, but today is the announcement and uh, May 26th is the opening date. So get after that. And that was great news. The other thing um, the mayor talked about, of course, the 1.25 billion, I think Mayor, you used the word trickle down. And um, the, uh, the 1.25 billion that was part of the CARES Act that was designed specifically as direct payments to states. And then there was, um, that was part of about $150 billion price tag nationwide, it was distributed based on population. And there was a, a part of that that went to states and, and then to cities of 500,000 or larger. Obviously, we don't have any cities with 500,000 people. So there was no direct payment from the federal government to, stick to, the, uh, to the city of Grand Forks or Fargo or any other city in North Dakota. However, 40% of the 1.25 billion that went to the state is to be distributed from the state level to the community level to the to the uh, other political subdivisions counties and and local governments obviously including grand forks uh, there's some important guidance that keeps moving a little bit but it's moving in the right direction and uh in fact today in the banking committee secretary uh secretary mnuchin uh informed us again of the uh of the loosening of some of those dollars originally you might recall that it was specifically to reimburse for COVID 19 direct expenses but then, um, you know, one of the one of the you know, consequences, I guess, of the unemployment insurance expansion that you spoke of, Mr. Mayor, was that um, you know, while states manage the unemployment, they sort of set the, they set the uh, qualifications and whatnot. Um, they also fund part of it, even though the federal government funds a big part of it. Obviously, employers uh, buy the unemployment insurance. Well, the state share was getting to be really high, so Treasury changed the guidance a little bit and opened it up to include state share of unemployment uh, insurance benefits for from their 60 percent well then just last week and then again reiterated today in our banking committee secretary mnuchin announced that they've loosened that up even further and uh the new guidance includes money for communities and this really generally comes down to, to cities the, for emergency services, which the, you know doesn't take much of a stretch to make sure the, to uh, understand that emergency services are an important part of uh, of the relief and an important cost to uh, to the relief uh, and to the pandemic. The other thing is sanitation, even sanitary um, expenses. Obviously, again, important to uh, the relief from a pandemic like this. So I th what Treasury is trying to do is make it is make the money as flexible as the law will allow so that communities like Grand Forks are able to apply uh, for broader reimbursement. And uh, I don't think it, you know, I, again, I, I think money's there to be utilized, not to be hoarded by um, the federal government. It doesn't do much good to send money to a state 
for community use and then make sure that it can't be utilized. So I think the Treasury Department's done a good job as we've moved along, sort of opening all of that up. Um, so with that, I think um, I'll just sort of leave it at that, Mr. Mayor. And then if you know, people have some questions later, we'll try to try to help out with that. Well, thank you, Senator, for that update. And thank you for all your hard work on our behalf. And pleasure. now we'll hear from Congressman Armstrong. Welcome. Kramer, yeah, I, um, am I good? All right. Uh, I, I, I agree. The USDA news was good in a long time coming. Um, OMB had had that for longer than I think we wanted them to have it, but it's out today. Um, and it's good. One other thing. I would add, particularly for the Grand Forks region, is the specialty crop provisions, which are really important to mm -hmm. potato farmers and even some degree sugar beets up there. But we continue to deal with all of those things. And then also at the same time, we are obviously triaging new things that come up, We're hearing a lot about prevent plant right now, cover crop. Uh, there's still, I mean, Mayor, before we started this, you and I were talking offline, we dodged a lot of bullets with flooding, but we didn't dodge them all. Um, there's overland flooding, there's fields that are still underwater. Uh, as wet as it was in the Red River Valley last October, it continues, I mean, we continue to deal with those things. So we keep doing that. Obviously, Western North Dakota cattle ranching uh, is a huge issue. So Senator Kramer, Senator Hoven have been doing uh, a lot on that in the Senate side. Uh, from the antitrust side on, on in the House, uh, Jim Jordan, who actually has a lot of cattle or a lot of uh, hogs in his district and is now the ranking member on judiciary, we're working, we're going through that role because... Uh, you know, we're not on ag and we're not on those committees. What we are on is one committee that can look at anti-competitive um, pricing and things and like that. So uh, one of, this is an issue that's been important to me. I know it's been important to Senator Kramer, even when he was in the house, uh, it could be a lonely position in DC on that issue uh, because of some supply chain issues that have happened. A lot of supply chain issues that have happened over the last couple months. Uh, we have more friends now about this issue, so we're gonna continue. But as is all things in DC, momentum is momentum can be a fleeting thing. So we're gonna continue to push forward with that. Uh, oil's taken it, I mean, egg and oil, I mean, agriculture didn't start from zero when COVID hit. So um, we've already been struggling on different things. Obviously the oil industry is uh, very important, not just to Western North Dakota, but to the whole, but to the whole state. Uh, our tax revenues clearly depend on it. Uh, I think what the uh, state is doing with the orphaned well program is a really good idea. We're looking at depending on what phase four looks like. And I'd be interested in what Senator Kramer has to say about that. I, my preference is that we continue to work with the uh, federal agencies to make the three and a half phases as dynamic as possible and as user friendly as possible. Uh, I don't think it uh, can be underestimated what uh, Senator Kramer just talked about. Before we throw more and more money at a lot of different things that have so many restrictions that rural states can't utilize it, and it's all states, but we see it from the rural perspective, can't utilize it for what we need to utilize it for. He talked about backfilling unemployment insurance. That was the number one thing that when we're talking to Governor Burgum and Lieutenant Governor Sanford that they cared about um, is making sure that uh, everybody, everybody recognizes how COVID affects each state is different but it's affected us all very much. You know, we're just under 2000 cases in North Dakota, uh, just under 1300 uh, have been cleared and still at 45 deaths, which is 45 too many, but it's still a pretty low number. But our economy has been affected from one end of the state to the other by this in, in tremendous ways. And I, I will say, I, I campaigned on this, I say it, I, and, being in Grand, and being in DC for the last 18 months has not changed my mind. The more we can allow state and local leaders in North Dakota to make these decisions, the better off we'll be. So the more we can keep, um, keep more of these things flexible and allow, allow us to deal with it on the ground, the better off we'll be. And I think that is the right approach before we start throwing another three trillion at everything with so many different restrictions. Um, there's been tremendous impacts across the healthcare community, across the ag community, across the business community from one of the state to the other. Uh, and the, all of these programs we've scaled up are not without their problems, and we hear about them every day. I will say this, and this is one thing I hope we continue, can, can continue to move forward after this crisis, is this is the most dynamic the federal bureaucracy has ever been. 
Uh, we scaled up a program in the PPP through the SBA and Treasury that would have taken many, many months, if not years, under normal circumstances to develop. And we're doing it with our community bankers who are not used to um, dealing with regulations as they're changing on a daily basis. But one of the positive things that I think has really come out of this is how responsive the Trump administration was to on the ground concerns. And it's caused frustration because you'll see a your treasury will give guidance on Tuesday and then they'll change that guidance by Thursday. But almost always that guidance is changed to the benefit to the end consumer. And if we can do that in this type of scenario when everybody is, I mean, trying to scale up and even the federal agencies are working from home and learning how to utilize this technology, there is no reason the federal government can't work more like that in the future. I would say one thing everybody's problem with the federal government is, is A, there's too much of it, particularly in regulation and bureaucracy. And two, they just don't respond to anything <laughs> in any reasonable manner. That hasn't been the case here. We, I mean, we haven't always got what we've wanted when we've talked to Treasury or SBA, but they have made a lot of changes through the course of this and done it in real time that has, been, that has benefited workers and businesses, not just in North Dakota, but all across the country. And hopefully we can learn from that and keep the federal government moving forward in that regard. Because that, if, if, we could, if we can get a little bit of that under what I call regular order, that will be a really good thing for everybody from one end of the country or one end of the state to the other and across the country. And it really truly is, it's been a great program. And part of that is because of what you said, Mayor, um, North Dakota was, uh, I mean, there are a lot of people who bank with small bankers across the state that are really happy they do. Uh, this is a, this is really a program, and the reason North Dakota did it is because uh, our small our, our community banks were at the I mean they were they were putting in a, I don't know the hours they were putting in implementing this program, but they did this, and it's because they don't treat their customers just like tr customers. You know, they not only they sponsor the local baseball team and donate to whatever whatever goes on in your communities, but these are their friends, these are their, their community members, and they really did come through in a huge way. And there's a reason North Dakota um, was as good as it was that. And I, I do have to give a lot of credit to the Commerce Department, the governor's office and the Bank of North Dakota. I mean, they were setting, I'm sure people were sick of hearing from me and maybe even sick of hearing from the Senator. We were on, we were on conference calls um, sometimes twice a day with these guys trying to make sure these programs got implemented. And like I said, they're not without their problems. Senator Kramer said there are people who fall through the cracks. That's always going to be the case, but we're going to continue to work towards those things and get them better. So, and then with that, I would leave it for any questions as well. well thank you very much. And that next portion of our program, uh, we go to John Bergstrom, who's going to moderate a 15 minute question and answer segment. John? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, again, uh, members of the media, please use the hand raise feature so I know how to uh, know to call on you that you have a question. And uh, also letting you know, we have uh, Director Deb Swanson from Grand Forks Public Health and Todd Phelan, Grand Forks City Administrator, available for questions as well. First question will come from KNOX Radio. Uh, this question is for Senator Kramer. Senator Kramer, earlier today, it was announced through the markets that China is well behind on what they're supposed to purchase from the United States in regard to agricultural products as part of the trade deal that was worked out. They're also responsible for this virus spreading around the globe. It's killed 100,000 or rather 90,000 people in the United States. They're not buying our egg products. They're responsible for this virus. When can we expect a response to China and their responsibility for this? And what do you believe that response should be? Yeah, well, that's a great question. It's a complicated question. Obviously, China, not only, not only, do they, uh, not only are they a communist country that has been far less than transparent and bears much of the responsibility, as you noted, for the spread of this awful disease. And the spread definitely could have been contained had, uh, had China and the World Health Organization been much more transparent. So you have that on the one hand. But on the other hand, you also have a country of one and a half billion people who eat three times a day and buy a lot of the and, and like a lot of the products that we grow, and so it, it is a bit of a it is a bit of a challenge to say the least. Um, you know, I think that clearly the patience with China among the American public as well as the the uh, leadership of our country is wearing very thin. And um, you know, every now and then you see an occasional criticism of people who criticize China, but by and large, people are are figuring out that these are. These are not great allies or friends that we have. And that's just scratching the surface. I mean, when it comes to things like, you know, 
5G, their theft of intellectual property, their build out of um, very sophisticated weapons systems, largely that they've stolen from us, um, the building of, of islands in the South China Sea. I mean, China is not an ally. They are clearly an adversary. And we have to always keep that in mind. That said, on the trade front, I think that more and more we have to respond to China by trying to find a way to do things without China. Clearly, there's an emphasis, and a lot of us are on bills to try to bring much of our supply chain home, um, especially for critical things like uh, you know pharmaceuticals and the, the, the uh, you know the required ingredients for pharmaceuticals. So, protective protection equipment uh, or personal protection equipment, uh, food supply. And we're seeing the vulnerabilities uh, of all of that. Um, and at, at the same time, they still try to, you know, they're trying to buy energy companies. Obviously, they'd like to take advantage of the fact that we have, you know, low, low value to very um, high potential energy uh, opportunities. And, and so they'd like to buy it all up. And I think we have to, we have to put our foot down and, either not allow any of that or allow a lot less of it. But we also have to remember, we have to be able to find something to replace China. That's a really big market. And this is why I think is just an absolute move of genius that the president, that President Trump befriended Prime Minister Modi of India. India, as you know, right next door in the neighborhood, uh, I've gotten to know the Prime Minister fairly well and certainly many of the diplomats from India and a lot of the Indian Americans in, in the uh, here in the United States and, and especially in, in North Dakota, many of them, of course, uh, are in our healthcare system, and uh, they're an important ally. And uh, the reason they're so important is not only because they're nearly one and a half billion hungry people, but also because they're the world's largest democracy. And while they're not the kind of democracy, the type of self-governed, you know, democracy uh, that we are in the United States, they are far more like us than China. And um, they create a really a, a leverage point for us as well as a, a big friendly market. So I've worked a lot on policy related specifically to India, to Indian Americans. And um, you know, some of the pulse crops and the things that we grow are in, in high demand in India. Now they also grow a lot of them themselves. So we need to, on the one hand, make sure that we, we diminish our reliance on, on China, whether it's for money, whether it's for cheap stuff, uh, or, or for market share. But at the same time, we need to be looking for new partners to step into that. And I think India is a real logical, large choice, as well as, of course, several others. Thank you, Senator. Next question from Neil Carlson at iNews. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, my question is for Deb Swanson. Sorry, I got here late. I'm not sure if you covered any of this, but um, are, do you have any information about any uh, possible COVID flare-ups at Simplot or uh, any other facilities around the county? Hi, Neil. Uh, I don't have any information about any uh, clusters of cases, but certainly if we do determine that there are as a result of contact tracing, we would absolutely explore those. Thank you, Deb. Next question from Joe Bowen at the Grand Forks Herald. Yeah, uh, basically same question for Deb, uh, except we uh, have heard a rumor that an employee or two at Target in town here, I want to stress it's a rumor for anybody listening, uh, but we heard a rumor that uh, a couple of them have tested positive. Is that the case? I don't have any information to suggest that. We did have 28 cases that were positive over the last week since last Tuesday, but there were zero cases reported yesterday and today. Uh, next question from Mr. Chris Larson. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Ken. Question is for Sandra Kramer. Uh, Sandra Kramer, a lot of talk, and, and Kelly, you can answer this too, a lot of talk from Seema Verma uh, yesterday with regards to um, relaxing some of the requirements and regulations for uh, long-term care facilities. One thing that hasn't been addressed yet, visitations. From what you have heard, Senator and, and Representative Armstrong, where is where is the administration on that right now? Well, I, I, Chris, I got most of that, but the last couple of sentences you said um, you talked about long term care facilities, but but what was yes, the last uh, one? long long term care facilities? Where where is the administration in regards to opening up uh, long term care facilities for visitation? 
Sure. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure I got that right. So I talked to, I talked to administrator um, Ruma on Friday of last week, and she told me that she was looking to do a, a new guidance on Monday, which they did do late yesterday. She announced new guidance as it relates to opening up long t- long-term care facilities, nursing homes for visitation. Now, <laughs> When, when a, and, I, and I love Seema Verma, I think she does a great job. And we know that, of course, uh, our nursing homes are home to the most vulnerable population to this disease. And we know what, where the big breakouts have been. In fact, I think something like 40% of the deaths from this disease have occurred in nursing homes. But I don't, that, that, that probably wouldn't be real surprising, I guess, when you think about statistically what the, you know, the, who the vulnerable population is. But nonetheless, there, there have been policies around the country that have not only have they not protected nursing home residents very well, um, <laughs> they've done just the opposite. And so, I think in North Dakota, we've done a, you know done a good job of, of protecting that population. Unfortunately, one of the consequences of that, of course, is that um, to keep the disease out, you have to keep people from the outside out. Um, my mother happens to be in a in a facility in Fargo where they've had you know, quite a number of people. Now they've only had two deaths, that's two too many, but um, there've been a lot of people with that have tested positive, but most of them are employees. And those employees, of course, are more likely bringing it in than they are taking it out. All of that said, with what we have today in terms of uh, you know, greater access to PPEs, greater access to, um, to testing, uh, she, uh, Administrator Verma, in their guidance last night, is setting the stage for allowing states and local communities to open up nursing homes t- to visitors. Um, now, with that comes some guidance. I, and if I if I read it right, Chris, and this is sort of my read on it, I, I'm not certainly not the expert. And and the, the criteria for doing all of this, of course, really rests with states and and the local communities, and in many cases, the facilities themselves. CMS does not mandate anything. However, no secret that, that the Center for and CMS for people that may not know is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, they do provide the, the distribute the funding largely for through Medicaid mainly and, and as well as Medicare. And so whenever you're when you're the payer, you have a lot to say about the policies and they do have criteria to, that, that they want uh, they expect to be followed to keep their residents safe. That said, the guidance from yesterday, does start the process and my read of it is is that somewhere you know as you approach that what's considered the third phase in the uh, in this in the uh, restart if you will um somewhere around the third phase it would you'd be eligible to open up but it does require you know some good benchmark testing i think most of the facilities now and mary you might know this uh, most of the facilities have done benchmark testing of all staff and all uh residents and then being able to, obviously you have to have sort of that ongoing because every day is a new day and every person you come in ta- contact with is a new person. But uh, she did, like I said, she did announce late yesterday that um, we can start the process toward phase three of, of reopening for visitation. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Kramer, Representative Armstrong. Yeah, and I would just add on to that. I mean, I think it's really important to recognize one, that we get some I mean, the local decision making in that, but two, also that what Senator Kramer said, that is truly our vulnerable um, population. So as we continue, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, I know there's at least one mayor at one city in this country that said they're not going to reopen until we have a cure or a vaccine. Uh, That was never intended. That was never what the intent of this was. The intent was to be able to build the capacity to deal with this in, in a normal fashion. But also as we continue to do that, whether it's North Dakota Smart Restart or anything, we want to protect uh, those people. So that could change. But even once we get to that third stage, that could change community to community in a real quick hurry. Uh, we know North Dakota has some of the best broadband in the country. We've been talking to the AARP and some different people about scaling up the, the capacity for Wi-Fi. And it's something as simple as five iPads to be able to utilize in, um, in, in those types of situations as well. Uh, and have been talking about that because that is something that even continuing moving forward in the grand scheme of how the federal government spends money, that's a pretty low cost solution. And you got, you, you got uh, enough Wi-Fi capacity in t- internally within these homes and the ability to do video calls. I know that's not a perfect answer, 
but it is uh, in some of these places, it's just, it, they haven't even had that ability to do that. So being able to do that when we do have, you know, these fires that have to get put out in these different communities across the country, because you, you, you can also know this, if it, I mean, if there is a big, um, you know, a clustered outbreak in a particular community, one of the first places that's going to um, go on lockdown, so to speak, is going to be the elder care facility or those types of places because of the vulnerable nature of their, um, of their population. So we want to be able to get towards that, but we also want to utilize technology in this way to be able to do it as much as possible. Thank you, Representative. Uh, next question from KNOX. Heard uh, about various next level responses uh, for Senator Kramer in case that didn't get caught uh, regarding um, what will happen as far as PPP loans, as far as uh, more stimulus money, as far as the extension of the extra $600 uh, benefit for uh, unemployment. Some of that was grouped together in a big bill that was sent over to the Senate. May have been political implications, may not have been. What's the Senate's thoughts? What are the thoughts of your colleagues as far as what the next monetary response from Congress is for COVID-19? Yeah, well, yeah, great question. And that's that's sort of the main question around town here. Um, every gaggle that I stop at, the, the press gaggle that I stop at, uh, which is a couple of day, that's kind of the, the main question. So um, the, in fact, today, the president at lunch very specifically stated, he said he thinks the Senate Republicans are sort of doing it the right way. Let's get through this week. Um, next week is Memorial Day week, so that Congress won't be in session next week. And then when we come back, take a look at, at where we are at the time. <clears throat> Kelly referenced it earlier, Representative Armstrong referenced, uh, referenced it earlier, and that is you know, to try to keep some flexibility. And he, made, he made a really important point, which I appreciate him raising, um, that the warp speed at which both the Congress and the bureaucracy has has created and then administered these programs. Part of part of that's been a little frust frustrating because, of course, some of the rules have been being adjusted on the fly. But that's because they're responding to what people are saying. And we've been particularly blessed to be able to, you know, be on the right committees, represent people who are very engaged, have stakeholder groups like Kelly said, you know, community bankers and whatnot that are having their input. And as a result, they're getting it. We're getting it in. Um, I've had as many as three calls a day from three different cabinet secretaries uh, to talk to them about a specific case with a specific stakeholder. Uh, may, might've been a city, might've been a county, might've been an individual. And uh, that, so literally the dy dynamics, as Kelly called it, uh, it really been remarkable to watch. It's actually kind of encouraging in a way, although <clears throat> most things should require more thought than, than, than a crisis, hopefully. However, with regard to the next phase, that's why we still, um, save people, you know, paycheck protection, for example, in North Dakota, I think over 80% of the eligible um, workforce has been covered by paycheck protection. Now we're looking at loosening the rules a little bit. There's still, I think, $100 billion that has not yet been lent um, uh, up from the phase two part of it. So there's, you know, that's sort of slowed down the demand for that. But there's another, you know, I don't know, trillion dollars or so in in uh, treasury funds that are to be leveraged with uh, credit tools at uh, Federal Reserve that are still being rolled out. Uh, the The next phase, of course, was the um, the Main Street lending program, which was for employers up to ten thousand, and uh, and that one had a little bit of a clumsy rollout, and then it made some adjustments with an expanded uh, program. Um, but there's still a pretty big gap for mid to large companies, mid-sized large companies that are that were credit worthy before COVID-19, um, but they're not investment grade, and they tend to sort of fall through the cracks. You would have you would have been happy to loan them money, you know, in in February, and a lot of them are in North Dakota, frankly. But now they're they're not you know they're not bankable, if you will, because they're highly leveraged companies. There's just a lot of that stuff that's just starting to roll out. Um, not even, you know, not even final rules yet, but over the next days and weeks. So we really haven't seen how, how that's going to play in the, uh, into the economy and how, how that will affect things. The mayor, I think, made the point early on that I really appreciated. And that is, you know, not, nothing, all the money in the world isn't going to do a lot. He didn't say it this way. I don't want to, don't want to put him in the spot, but all the money in the world is not going to matter until the economy's reopened. 
So what I do think we need to do though, is we need to look for ways to make sure people can pay their rent, you know, make their mortgage payment. The things that actually, they're fun, fundamental to the economy, to everybody's economy. There's a lot of times we can, we can talk about billions and trillions of dollars that might help, uh, you know, uh, the stock market. And that's, I don't want to diminish the importance of things like that. However, what we really need to focus on, in my view, in the next package is what helps the economy. And, and by economy, I mean the individual's economy, the family's economy, um, the small business's economy. And that's going to be reopening. You know, as much as anything, it's reopening it so that, that people can, first of all, get to work and that people uh, can shop, that people can start spending money on the things that they want to spend money on. And then, and then I think you're going to see a, you're going to see that bounce back much higher than if we just put a whole bunch of money into some sort of credit facilities and provide provide a lot of liquidity for the markets. But we do need to provide liquidity for like retailers, for restaurants, and um, you know, and others that while we've been able to cover through the Paycheck Protection Program the, their payroll. That doesn't really help the owner of the, of the place pay their rent, doesn't help them pay. I mean, it can be used for some of that, but it's still at some point they have to make money with their customers. And so, um, you know, we, we need to get, we just need to get things reopened up. And then I think we can take a look at a, a next round. Um, with regard to un unemployment insurance, one of the things we don't want to do ever again, and we tried to change this before the CARES Act passed. We, tried to do it in negotiation. We tried to do it on the floor the day that we passed the bill, but we failed in the amendment process. And we can't continue to provide a greater incentive to not work than to work. Um, certainly, certainly uh, plussing up unemployment insurance, extending it for people that have to be unemployed because their place of you know work isn't open that is one thing, but they should be able to make more money not working than working because it just creates a perverse incentive that works against us. So uh, we certainly in the next tranche have to, have to take care of that. Yeah, and I would just add one thing to that. This this package that uh, we sent over, and I use the term "we" pretty loosely, <laughs> um, and extended that six hundred dollars unemployment till January thirty first of two thousand twenty one without any caveats. Now, I come from an area where there are going to be people whose jobs no longer exist, um, and I think it's important to recognize: in order to have a good job, you have to have a good business to work for. And that's what North Dakota is built on is small businesses. But at the same time, um, the, you know, the political dynamics are different in every community across this country. And if that unemployment insurance is just blanketed out under no, with no guardrails until January 31st of 2021, that is, that is exactly what Senator Kramer is just talking about. Uh, there is no government program that can subsidize 100% of lost business. And if local mayors and we're not incentivizing to do smart restarts and do these things, then we are going to see temporary furloughed employees become permanently unemployed in a really quick hurry. So I agree, we need to take care of the people who need it, but it can't be a blanket, no guardrails, just extend it all the way until the end of January next year, because that will not help solve the problem. Thank you, Representative. Um, we're going a little bit long here, but we'll take two more. Uh, next one from Neil Carlson. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, Deb Swanson again. Um, this question, apart from a viewer, uh, Governor Burgum has indicated he's trying to do a total test of all the nursing homes across the state. And it appears that maybe, you know, well, I guess we won't name specific ones out in Western North Dakota. There are some of them now that are declining to do that. Do you have any legal mandate, at least in Grand Forks County, if you see a cluster to walk in and go, well, we're going to test everyone at this company or organization? Grand Forks Public Health Department doesn't have a specific mandate over nursing homes. They are regulated by the state health department. But I will say this, the information that I have about nursing home testing is that it's been offered everywhere. There were a few that declined it, but I think it was because they declined it at the specific time it was offered, but then rescheduled it. So a lot of it has to do with their capacity to carry it out. And then I know there was one that was canceled due to lab capacity, but that one was rescheduled. If there are others that have not had uh, the opportunity to take advantage of the testing, I'm not aware of that. What I do know about is Grand Forks County and all of our long-term care facilities here have embraced the opportunities 
They've needed little assistance to do it. They're, they've been very vigilant about it. And all of their results are reported on the North Dakota Department of Health website. Thank you, Deb. And our final question uh, from Mr. Joe Bowen. Hey there, uh, this is a reader question or at least a question from somebody on Facebook here. Uh, what's the plan if there's a spike or a rise in cases later this summer, like say in August or September? Um, I will going to direct this one to first to Director Swanson. I want to add a comment to that question. And the comment is because we have our federal representatives here, I want to take an, um, advantage of the opportunity to thank them for the funding that's come through the CARES Act that actually is filtering down to the local level to Grand Forks Public Health Department indeed. Uh, public health is on the front line and we are the ones that are, have responded from the very beginning of this pandemic. So the funding will be very well used and it will cover the entire state of North Dakota because it's largely delivered at the county level. Uh, but with respect to your question, um, we like our data in public health, unfortunately, testing data lags a little bit in terms of what's really happening out there. And we also know that we have asymptomatic carriage of this particular virus. So we are going to be watching the information very closely. We do want to help increase testing. We do want to make sure the most vulnerable people in our uh, service area are protected. That includes long-term care. It includes a lot of other vulnerable individuals as well. So we're going to be working very hard to continue all of our prevention messaging that includes when businesses do open, they need to really be following the guidance to protect their employees and protect their patrons. So those are the things we will be doing in public health. And I can't predict the future, uh, what will happen, but we will certainly be monitoring the situation every day, just as we are doing now. And we will respond to whatever actions we think might need to be taken, whether it's on a local level, following state guidance or following any particular federal guidance that we get from the Centers for Disease Control. I would agree. Thank you, Deb Swanson, and thank you for members of the media for, uh, for joining us uh, here this afternoon. We're, we're going to wrap this up. Now, we've normally ended these with Mayor Brown having the final word, and we will do that again. But uh, since we have our federal delegation here, uh, Senator Kramer, Representative Armstrong, any final word you'd like to give to the Grand Forks community? Well, the one thing that I would say, and thank you for the opportunity, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for doing this. I know it's a great service to people there. And one thing that's the most helpful thing in a time like this is good information. So thanks for providing us this forum and for doing this. Uh, and to, to Deborah, um, you, you're right. I mean, public health is really on the front lines in, in so many of these communities. And um, one of the things I probably should have said earlier, and it's a, not a bad time to talk about because the, the most recent question raises the point too, and that is, whatever happens in the future, the one thing that there is complete bipartisan support on, and that is we always have to be, as a Congress, nimble and, and ready to provide whatever resources are necessary to fight the disease itself and to fight its spread. And so, um, you know, even if there's not another stimulus package, there's, there needs to be assistance ready to go to our, our healthcare facilities and, um, you know, whether it's from the state level to the the community level and obviously to all of our all of our systems so that's one thing second thing is you make the point perfectly as to what kelly and i are talking about to confirm what kelly and i are talking about and that is the main thing is, is that that we remain as flexible as possible and that's why the resources have to be as local as possible because she makes the point to your question um what if the what if well the, the people most able to deal with the what if uh, you know, are the local folks. And they can only do that if they have um, good information. And the lag, for example, from testing is good information, but sometimes, you know, time is also important. So uh, I would just congratulate uh, the mayor and, and, to, and the, the county and uh, all of you for, for being diligent, for being connected. You know, thank you for being uh, accessible to us as we try to shape public policy that is helpful to the people that we all work for. So um, as always, uh, the door is always open and the phone line is always open and, and uh, call whenever we can be helpful. In the meantime, stay safe. Um, but but don't, my, my last admonition is, but please don't trade in living for surviving. Um, you know, I, I worry a little bit about that, that fear has a paralysis about it. And uh, 
uh, you know, we, we can both, you know, live with, with great joy and great um, connectivity and, and great active activism and maybe even some baseball, Kelly, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but also be safe. <laughs> Thank you. We, we need baseball. Um, my wife's a little sick of me watching classic major league games from 1995, our 91 twins, 87 twins on TV, uh, 86 Mets. But I, I agree with that. And I think one of the really truly false narratives that has come out of this whole thing is you're trying to base health versus the economy. And that has just really been disheartening to me because that's not the argument. The argument is health and our society. Uh, people need to be able to interact. I have a 12 year old and a 10 year old at home. And I can tell you, um, outside of failing as a homeschool parent um, <laughs> and have more appreciation for our teachers from one end of the state to the other. But I, I mean, it, it, I have two very well adjusted, uh, great kids, and this is wearing on them as well. We need to be able to have our societal interactions. And I think it's also, this goes to that last question too, is when we have flare ups, one thing we have is the capacity. Two, we have a governor who understands data as well as anybody. Three, uh, both our both our largest communities in the Red River or in the Red River Valley have mayors that are doctors. Uh, I feel like you all are much better able to deal with these things, provided you have the resources available than any politician in D.C. From it doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican, particularly as different areas go through their peaks at different times. So. We've built up the capacity. We know more about, we still don't know enough, but we know more about this virus than we did two months ago. And we have uh, just a societal and community uh, relationship with each other to deal with. So that's how we deal with those things. That's how we keep moving forward. And that's how we don't lose our society in the process as well. So thank you, Mayor Brown, for having us. It's always great to talk to you, Senator Kramer. Um, I, I think we're ships passing in the night back and forth to DC. <laughs> Although I'm not sure we're going back ever again. So. Very empty ships, though. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator Kramer and Congressman Armstrong, for taking times out of your busy schedules and joining us today. And thank you for all your hard work on our behalf. Working effectively across federal, state, and local government will be critical moving forward. And Grand Force in North Dakota can be assured we have good teams at all levels in place working together effectively. Remember to keep up the physical distancing measures and follow the guidelines set by the, DDC, by the CDC and by the state of North Dakota. Stay vigilant, stay cautious, slow the spread, and save lives. We're in this together, we'll get through this together, and together we will emerge stronger. Thank you.